Disc 2 Colonel Pikeaway, his bulk sprawled out in his chair in the small room in Bloomsbury, where he sat from ten to five with a short interval for lunch, was surrounded as usual by an atmosphere of thick cigar smoke. With his eyes closed, only an occasional blink showed that he was awake and not asleep. He seldom raised his head. Somebody had said that he looked like a cross between an ancient Buddha and a large blue frog, with perhaps, as some impudent youngster had added, just a touch of a bar sinister from a hippopotamus in his ancestry. The gentle buzz of the intercom on his desk roused him. He blinked three times and opened his eyes. He stretched forth a rather weary-looking hand and picked up the receiver. Well, he said. His secretary's voice spoke. The minister is here waiting to see you. Is he now? said Colonel Pikeaway. And uh, what minister is that? The Baptist minister from the church round the corner? Oh, no, Colonel Pikeaway. It's Sir George Packham. Pity, said Colonel Pikeaway, breathing asthmatically. Great pity. The Reverend McGill is far more amusing. There's a splendid touch of hellfire about him. Shall I bring him in, Colonel Pikeaway? I suppose he will expect to be brought in at once. Under-secretaries are far more touchy than secretaries of state, said Colonel Pikeaway gloomily. All these ministers insist on coming in and having kittens all over the place. Sir George Packham was shown in. He coughed and wheezed. Most people did. The windows of the small room were tightly closed. Colonel Pikeaway reclined in his chair, completely smothered in cigar ash. The atmosphere was almost unbearable and the room was known in official circles as the small cat-house. "'Ah, my dear fellow,' said Sir George, speaking briskly and cheerfully, in a way that did not match his ascetic and sad appearance. "'Quite a long time since we've met, I think.' Uh, "'Sit down, uh, sit down, do,' said Pikeaway. "'Have a cigar?' Sir George shuddered slightly. Uh, "'No, thank you,' he said. Uh, "'No, uh, thanks very much.' He looked hard at the windows. Colonel Pikeaway did not take the hint. Sir George cleared his throat and coughed again before saying, <coughs> I believe Horsham has been to see you. Yes, Horsham's been and said his piece, said Colonel Pikeaway, slowly allowing his eyes to close again. I, I thought it was the best way. I mean that he should call upon you here. It's most important that things shouldn't get round anywhere. Ah, said Colonel Pikeaway. Ah, but they will, won't they? I beg your pardon? They will, said Colonel Pikeaway. I, I don't know how much you, uh, well, uh, know about this last business. We know everything here, said Colonel Pikeaway. That's what we're for. Oh, oh, yeah, yes, certainly. About Sir S. N. Uh, you know who I mean. A recently a passenger from Frankfurt said Colonel Pikeaway. A most extraordinary business. Most extraordinary. One wonders. One really does not know. I mean, one can't begin to imagine. Colonel Pikeaway listened kindly. What is one to think? pursued Sir George. Do you know him personally? I've come across him once or twice, said Colonel Pikeaway. One really cannot help wondering. Colonel Pikeaway subdued a yawn with some difficulty. He was rather tired of Sir George's thinking, wondering, and imagining. He had a poor opinion, anyway, of Sir George's process of thought. A cautious man, a man who could be relied upon to run his department in a cautious manner. Not a man of scintillating intellect. Perhaps, thought Colonel Pikeaway, all the better for that. At any rate, those who think and wonder, and are not quite sure, are reasonably safe in the place where God and the electors have put them. One cannot quite forget, continued Sir George, the disillusionment we have suffered in the past. Colonel Pikeaway smiled kindly. Charleston, Conway, and Courtfold, he said. Fully trusted, vetted, and approved of, all beginning with C, all crooked as sin. Sometimes I wonder if we can trust anyone, said Sir George unhappily. Oh, that's easy, said Colonel Pikeaway. You can't. Now take Stafford Nye, said Sir George. Good family, excellent family. Knew his father, his grandfather. 
Often a slip-up in the third generation, said Colonel Pikeaway. The remark did not help Sir George. I cannot help doubting, and I, I mean, um, sometimes he doesn't really seem serious. I took my two nieces to see the Chateau of the Loire when I was a young man, said Colonel Pikeaway unexpectedly. Man fishing on the bank. I had my fishing rod with me, too. He said to me, Vous n'êtes pas un pêcheur sérieux. Vous avez des femmes avec vous. You mean you think, Sir Stafford? No, no, never been mixed up with women much. Irony is his trouble. Like surprising people. He can't help liking to score off people. Well, that's not very satisfactory, is it? Why not? said Colonel Pikeaway. Liking a private joke is much better than having some deal with a defector. If one could feel that he was really sound, uh, what would you say? Your personal opinion? Sound as a bell, said Colonel Pikeaway. If a bell is sound, it makes a sound. Uh, but that's different, isn't it? He smiled kindly. Shouldn't worry if I were you, he said. Sir Stafford Nye pushed aside his cup of coffee. He picked up the newspaper, glancing over the headlines, then he turned it carefully to the page which gave personal advertisements. He'd looked down that particular column for seven days now. It was disappointing, but not surprising. Why on earth should he expect to find an answer? His eye went slowly down miscellaneous peculiarities, which had always made that particular page rather fascinating in his eyes, they were not so strictly personal. Half of them, or even more than half, were disguised advertisements, or offers of things for sale, or wanted for sale. They should perhaps have been put under a different heading, but they had found their way here, considering that they were more likely to catch the eye that way. They included one or two of the hopeful variety. Young man who objects to hard work, and who would like an easy life, would be glad to undertake a job that would suit him. Girl wants to travel to Cambodia, refuses to look after children. Firearm used at Waterloo. What offers? Glorious fun fur coat. Must be sold immediately. Owner going abroad. Do you know Jenny Capstan? Her cakes are superb. Come to 14 Lizard Street, SW3. For a moment, Stafford Nye's finger came to a stop. Jenny Capstan. He liked the name. Was there any Lizard Street? He supposed so. He had never heard of it. With a sigh, the finger went down the column, and almost at once was arrested once more. Passenger from Frankfurt. Thursday, November 11th. Hungerford Bridge, 7.20. Thursday, November 11th. That was... Yes, that was today. Sir Stafford Nye leaned back in his chair and drank more coffee. He was excited. Stimulated. Hungerford. Hungerford Bridge. He got up and went into the kitchenette. Mrs. Warrett was cutting potatoes into strips and throwing them into a large bowl of water. She looked up with some slight surprise. Anything you want, sir? Yes, said Sir Stafford Nye. If anyone said Hungerford Bridge to you, where would you go? Where should I go? Mrs. Warrett considered. You mean if I wanted to go, do you? Uh, we can proceed on that assumption. Well, then, I, I suppose I'd go to Hungerford Bridge, wouldn't I? You mean that you would go to Hungerford in Berkshire? Well, where is that? said Mrs. Warrett. Eight miles beyond Newbury. I've heard of Newbury. My old man backed a horse there last year. Did well, too. So you'd go to Hungerford near Newbury? Well, no, of course I wouldn't, said Mrs. Warrett. Go all that way? What for? I go to Hungerford Bridge, of course. You mean, well, it's near Charing Cross. You know where it is. Over the Thames. Yes, said Sir Stafford Nye. Yes, I do know where it is quite well. Thank you, Mrs. Warrid. It had been, he felt, rather like tossing a penny, heads or tails. An advertisement in a morning paper in London meant Hungerford Railway Bridge in London. Presumably, therefore, that is what the advertiser meant, although about this particular advertiser, Sir Stafford Nye was not at all sure. Her ideas, from the brief experience he had had of her, were original ideas. They were not the normal responses to be expected. But still, what else could one do? Besides, there were probably other Hungerfords, 
and possibly they would also have bridges in various parts of England. But today, well, today he would see. It was a cold, windy evening with occasional bursts of thin, misty rain. Sir Stafford Nye turned up the collar of his Mackintosh and plodded on. It was not the first time he had gone across Hungerford Bridge, but it had never seemed to him a walk to take for pleasure. Beneath him was the river, and crossing the bridge were large quantities of hurrying figures like himself. Their Mackintoshes pulled round them, their hats pulled down, and on the part of one and all of them an earnest desire to get home and out of the wind and rain as soon as possible. It would be, thought Sir Stafford Nye, very difficult to recognize anybody in this scurrying crowd. Seven twenty. Not a good moment to choose for a rendezvous of any kind. Perhaps it was Hungerford Bridge in Berkshire. Anyway, it seemed very odd. He plodded on. He kept an even pace, not overtaking those ahead of him, pushing past those coming the opposite way. He went fast enough not to be overtaken by the others behind him though it would be possible for them to do so if they wanted to. A joke, perhaps, thought Stafford Nye. Not quite his kind of joke, but someone else's. And yet not her brand of humour either, he would have thought. Hurrying figures passed him again, pushing him slightly aside. A woman in a Mackintosh was coming along, walking heavily. She collided with him, slipped, dropped to her knees. He assisted her up. All right? Yes, thanks. She hurried on. But as she passed him, her wet hand, by which he had held her as he pulled her to her feet, slipped something into the palm of his hand, closing the fingers over it. Then she was gone, vanishing behind him, mingling with the crowd. Stafford and I went on. He couldn't overtake her. She did not wish to be overtaken either. He hurried on, and his hand held something firmly, and so at long last it seemed— he came to the end of the bridge, on the Surrey side. A few minutes later, he had turned into a small café and sat there behind a table, ordering coffee. Then he looked at what was in his hand. It was a very thin oilskin envelope. Inside it was a cheap-quality white envelope. That, too, he opened. What was inside surprised him. It was a ticket. A ticket for the festival hall for the following evening. Chapter 5 Wagnerian Motif Sir Stafford Nye adjusted himself more comfortably in his seat and listened to the persistent hammering of the Nibelungen with which the program began. Though he enjoyed Wagnerian opera, Siegfried was by no means his favourite of the operas composing the ring. Rheingold and Gotterdammerung were his two preferences. The music of the young Siegfried Listening to the songs of the birds had always, for some strange reason, irritated him, instead of filling him with melodic satisfaction. It might have been because he went to a performance in Munich in his young days, which had displayed a magnificent tenor of unfortunately over-magnificent proportions, and he had been too young to divorce the joy of music from the visual joy of seeing a young Siegfried that looked even possibly young. The fact of an outsized tenor rolling about on the ground in an excess of boyishness had revolted him. He was also not particularly fond of birds and forest murmurs. No, give him the Rhine maidens every time. Although in Munich even the Rhine maidens in those days had been of fairly solid proportions. But that mattered less. Carried away by the melodic flow of water and the joyous impersonal song, he had not allowed visual appreciation to matter. From time to time he looked about him casually. He had taken his seat fairly early. It was a full house, as it usually was. The intermission came. Sir Stafford rose and looked about him. The seat beside his had remained empty. Someone who was supposed to have arrived had not arrived. Was that the answer? Or was it merely a case of being excluded because someone had arrived late, which practice still held on the occasions when Wagnerian music was listened to? He went out, strolled about, drank a cup of coffee, smoked a cigarette, and returned when the summons came. This time, as he drew near, he saw that the seat next to his was filled. Immediately his excitement returned. He regained his seat and sat down. Yes, it was the woman 
the Frankfurt Air Lounge. She did not look at him. She was looking straight ahead. Her face, in profile, was as clean-cut and pure as he remembered it. Her head turned slightly, and her eyes passed over him, but without recognition. So intent was that non-recognition that it was as good as a word spoken. This was a meeting that was not to be acknowledged. Not now, at any rate. The lights began to dim. The woman beside him turned. Excuse me. Could I look at your program? I have dropped mine, I'm afraid, coming to my seat. Of course, he said. He handed over the program, and she took it from him. She opened it, studied the items. The lights went lower. The second half of the program began. It started with the overture to Lohengrin. At the end of it, she handed back the program to him with a few words of thanks. Thank you so much. It was very kind of you. The next item was the Siegfried Forest murmur music. He consulted the program she had returned to him. It was then that he noticed something faintly penciled at the foot of a page. He did not attempt to read it now. Indeed, the light would have not been sufficient. He merely closed the program and held it. He had not, he was quite sure, written anything there himself. Not, that is, in his own program. She had, he thought, had her own program ready, folded perhaps in her handbag, and had already written some message ready to pass to him. Altogether, it seemed to him, there was still that atmosphere of secrecy, of danger. The meeting on Hungerford Bridge, and the envelope with the ticket forced into his hand, and now the silent woman who sat beside him. He glanced at her once or twice with the quick, careless glance that one gives a stranger sitting next to one. She lolled back in her seat. Her high-necked dress was of dull black crepe, an antique talk of gold encircled her neck. Her dark hair was cropped closely and shaped to her head. She did not glance at him or return any look. He wondered. Was there someone in the seats of the festival hall watching her? Or watching him? Noting whether they looked or spoke to each other? Presumably there must be. Or there must be at least the possibility of such a thing. She had answered his appeal in the newspaper advertisement. Let that be enough for him. His curiosity was unimpaired, but he did at least know now that Daphne Theodophanus, alias Mary Ann, was here in London. There were possibilities in the future of his learning more of what was afoot, but the plan of campaign must be left to her. He must follow her lead. As he had obeyed her at the airport, so he would obey her now, and, let him admit it, life had become suddenly more interesting. This was better than the boring conferences of his political life. Had a car really tried to run him down the other night? He thought it had. Two attempts, not only one. It was easy enough to imagine that one was the target of assault. People drove so recklessly nowadays that you could easily fancy malice aforethought when it was not so. He folded his program, did not look at it again. The music came to its end. The woman next to him spoke. She did not turn her head or appear to speak to him, but she spoke aloud with a little sigh between the words as though she was communing with herself, or possibly to her neighbour on the other side. The young Siegfried, she said, and sighed again. The programme ended with the march from De Meistersinger. After enthusiastic applause, people began to leave their seats. He waited to see if she would give him any lead but she did not. She gathered up her wrap, moved out of the row of chairs, and with a slightly accelerated step moved along with other people and disappeared in the crowd. Stafford Nye regained his car and drove home. Arrived there, he spread out the festival hall program on his desk and examined it carefully, after putting on the coffee to percolate. The program was disappointing, to say the least of it. There did not appear to be any message inside. Only on one page above the list of items were the pencil marks that he had vaguely observed, but they were not words, or letters, or even figures. They appeared to be merely a musical notation. It was as though someone had scribbled a phrase of music with a somewhat inadequate pencil. For a moment it occurred to Stafford Nye that there might perhaps be a secret message he could bring out by applying heat. 
Rather gingerly, and in a way rather ashamed of his melodramatic fancy, he held it towards the bar of the electric fire. But nothing resulted. With a sigh, he tossed the program back onto the table. But he felt justifiably annoyed. All this rigmarole. A rendezvous on a windy and rainy bridge overlooking the river, sitting through a concert by the side of a woman of whom he yearned to ask at least a dozen questions. And at the end of it, nothing. No further on. Still, she had met him. But why? If she didn't want to speak to him, to make further arrangements with him, why had she come at all? His eyes passed idly across the room to his bookcase, which he reserved for various thrillers, works of detective fiction, and an occasional volume of science fiction. He shook his head. Fiction, he thought, was infinitely superior to real life. Dead bodies, mysterious telephone calls, beautiful foreign spies in profusion. However, this particular elusive lady might not have done with him yet. Next time, he thought, he would make some arrangements of his own. Two could play at the game that she was playing. He pushed aside the program and drank another cup of coffee and went to the window. He had the program still in his hand. As he looked out towards the street below, his eyes fell back again on the open program in his hand, and he hummed to himself almost unconsciously. He had a good ear for music, and he could hum the notes that were scrawled there quite easily. Vaguely, they sounded familiar as he hummed them. He increased his voice a little. What was it now? Tum, ta 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 tum 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 Yes, definitely familiar. He started opening his letters. They were mostly uninteresting. A couple of invitations, one from the American Embassy, one from Lady Athelhampton, a charity variety performance which royalty would attend and for which it was suggested five guineas would not be an exorbitant fee to obtain a seat. He threw them aside lightly. He doubted very much whether he wished to accept any of them. He decided that instead of remaining in London, he would, without more ado, go and see his Aunt Matilda, as he had promised. He was fond of his Aunt Matilda, though he did not visit her very often. She lived in a rehabilitated apartment consisting of a series of rooms in one wing of a large Georgian manor house in the country, which he had inherited from his grandfather. She had a large, beautifully proportioned sitting-room, a small oval dining-room, a new kitchen made from the old housekeeper's room, two bedrooms for guests, a large comfortable bedroom for herself with an adjoining bathroom, and adequate quarters for a patient companion who shared her daily life. The remains of a faithful domestic staff were well provided for and housed. The rest of the house remained under dust sheets with periodical cleaning. Stafford Nye was fond of the place, having spent holidays there as a boy. It had been a gay house then. His eldest uncle had lived there with his wife and their two children. Yes, it had been pleasant there then. There had been money, and a sufficient staff to run it. He had not specially noticed in those days the portraits and pictures. There had been large-sized examples of Victorian art occupying pride of place, overcrowding the walls, but there had been other masters of an older age. Yes, there had been some good portraits there. A Rayburn, two Lawrences, a Gainsborough, a Lely, two rather dubious Van Dykes, a couple of Turners, too. Some of them had had to be sold to provide the family with money. He still enjoyed, when visiting there, strolling about and studying the family pictures. His Aunt Matilda was a great chatterbox, but she always enjoyed his visits. He was fond of her in a desultory way, but he was not quite sure why it was that he had suddenly wanted to visit her now. And what was it that had brought family portraits into his mind? Could it have been because there was a portrait of his sister Pamela, by one of the leading artists of the day twenty years ago? He would like to see that portrait of Pamela and look at it more closely, see how close the resemblance had been between the stranger who had disrupted his life in this really outrageous fashion and his sister. He picked up the Festival Hall program again with some irritation and began to hum the penciled notes. Tum, ta 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 tum. Then it came to him, and he knew what it was. It was the Siegfried motif, Siegfried's horn, the young Siegfried motif. That was what the woman had said last night, not apparently to him, not apparently to anybody. But it had been the message, a message that would have meant nothing to anyone around, since it would have seemed to refer to the music that had just been played. 
and the motif had been written on his program also in musical terms, the young Siegfried. It must have meant something. Well, perhaps further enlightenment would come. The young Siegfried. What the hell did that mean? Why? And how and when and what? <laughs> Ridiculous. All those questioning words. He rang the telephone and obtained Aunt Matilda's number. Oh, but of course, Daffy dear. It would be lovely to have you. Take the 4.30 train. It still runs, you know, but it gets here an hour and a half later. And it leaves Paddington later. Uh, 5.15. Uh, that's what they mean by improving the railways, I suppose. Stops at several most absurd stations on the way. All right. Horace will meet you at King's Marston. He's still there, then. Well, of course he's still there. I suppose he is, said Sir Stafford Nye. Horace, once a groom, then a coachman, had survived as a chauffeur, and apparently was still surviving. He must be at least eighty, said Sir Stafford. He smiled to himself. Chapter 6 Portrait of a Lady You look very nice and brown, dear said Aunt Matilda, surveying him appreciatively. Well, that's Malaya, I suppose. If it was Malaya you went to, or was it Siam or Thailand? They changed the names of all these places, and it really makes it very difficult. Anyway, it wasn't Vietnam, was it? You know, I didn't like the sound of Vietnam at all. It's all very confusing. North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and the Viet Cong, and the Viet... whatever the other thing is, and all wanted to fight each other, and nobody wanted to stop. They won't go to Paris, or wherever it is, and sit round tables and talk sensibly. Don't you think, really, dear? I've been thinking it over. I thought it would be a very nice solution. Uh, couldn't you make a lot of football fields? Then they could all go and fight each other there, but with less lethal weapons. Not that nasty palm-burning stuff, you know. Just hit each other and punch each other and all that. They'd enjoy it. Everyone would enjoy it. And you could charge admission for people to go and see them do it. I, I do really think that we don't understand giving people the things they really want. I think it's a very fine idea of yours, Aunt Matilda said Sir Stafford Nye, as he kissed a pleasantly perfumed, pale pink, wrinkled cheek. And how are you, my dear? Well, I'm old, said Lady Matilda Cleckheaton. Yes, I'm old. Of course, you don't know what it is to be old. If it isn't one thing, it's another. Rheumatism, or arthritis, or a nasty bit of asthma, or a sore throat, or an ankle you've turned. Always something, you know. Nothing very important, but there it is. Why have you come to see me, dear? Sir Stafford was slightly taken aback by the directness of the query. I usually come and see you when I return from a trip abroad. You'll have to come one chair nearer, said Aunt Matilda. I'm just that bit deafer since you saw me last. You look different. Why do you look different? Uh, because I'm more sunburnt. You said so. Nonsense. That's not what I mean at all. Don't tell me it's a girl at last. A girl? Well... I've always felt it might be one some day. The trouble is, you've got too much sense of humour. Now, why should you think that? Well, it's what people do think about you. Oh, yes, they do. Your sense of humour is in the way of your career, too. You know, you're all mixed up with all these people, diplomatic and political, what they call younger statesmen and elder statesmen and middle statesmen, too, and all these different parties. Really, I think it's too silly to have too many parties. First of all, those awful, awful Labour people— she raised her conservative nose into the air. Why, when I was a girl, there wasn't such a thing as a Labour Party. Nobody would have known what you meant by it. They'd have said nonsense. Pity it wasn't nonsense, too. And then there's the Liberals, of course, but they're terribly wet. And then there are the Tories, or the Conservatives, as they call themselves again now. And what's the matter with them? asked Stafford Nye, smiling slightly. Too many earnest women. Makes them lack gaiety, you know. Oh, well, no political party goes in for gaiety much nowadays. Just so, said Aunt Matilda. And then, of course, that's where you go wrong. You want to cheer things up. You want to have a little gaiety, and so you make a little gentle fun of people. And, of course, they don't like it. They say, ce n'est pas un garçon sérieux, <laughs> like that man in the fishing. Sir Stafford and I laughed. His eyes were wandering round the room. What are you looking at? said Lady Matilda. Your pictures. Oh, you don't want me to sell them, do you? Everyone seems to be selling their pictures nowadays. Old Lord Grampian, you know. He sold his Turners, and he sold some of his ancestors as well, and Geoffrey Gouldman. All those lovely horses of his. By Stubbs, weren't they? Something like that. Really, the prices one gets. But I didn't want to sell my pictures. I like them. Most of them in this room have a real interest because they're ancestors. I know nobody wants ancestors nowadays, but then I'm old-fashioned. I like ancestors. My own ancestors, I mean. What are you looking at? Pamela? 
Yes, I was. I was thinking about her the other day. Astonishing how alike you two are. I mean, it's not even as though you were twins. Though they say that different sex twins, even if they are twins, can't be identical, if you know what I mean. So Shakespeare must have made rather a mistake over Viola and Sebastian. Well, ordinary brothers and sisters can be alike, can't they? You and Pamela were always very alike to look at, I mean. Not in any other way. Don't you think we're alike in character? No, not in the least. That's the funny part of it. But, of course, you and Pamela have what I call the family face. Not a nigh face. I mean a bald and white face. Sir Stafford Nye had never quite been able to compete when it came down to talking on a question of genealogy with his great aunt. I've always thought that you and Pamela both took after Alexa, she went on. Which was Alexa? Your great-great, I think, one more great-grandmother, Hungarian, a Hungarian countess or baroness or something. Your great-great-grandfather fell in love with her when he was at Vienna in the embassy. Yes, Hungarian. That's what she was, very sporting, too. They are sporting, you know, Hungarians. She rode to hounds, rode magnificently. Is she in the picture gallery? She's on the first landing, just over the head of the stairs, a little to the right. I must go and look at her when I go to bed. Well, why don't you go and look at her now? Then you can come back and talk about her. Well, I will, if you like. He smiled at her. He ran out of the room and up the staircase. Yes, she had a sharp eye, old Matilda. That was the face. That was the face that he had seen and remembered. Remembered not for its likeness to himself, not even for its likeness to Pamela, but for a closer resemblance still to this picture here, a handsome girl brought home by his ambassador great-great-great-grandfather. If that was enough great, Aunt Matilda was never satisfied with only a few. About twenty she had been. She had come here and been high-spirited, and rode a horse magnificently, and danced divinely, and men had fallen in love with her. But she had been faithful, so it was always said, to great-great-great-grandfather, a very steady and sober member of the diplomatic service. She had gone with him to foreign embassies, and Rick had been passed down to him and to his sister, Pamela. He wondered if the young woman who had doped his beer and forced him to lend her his cloak, and who had depicted herself as being in danger of death unless he did what she asked, had been possibly related as a fifth or sixth cousin removed, a descendant of the woman pictured on the wall at which he looked. Well, it could be. They had been of the same nationality, perhaps. Anyway, their faces had resembled each other a good deal. How upright she'd sat at the opera! How straight that profile! The thin, slightly arched, aquiline nose, and the atmosphere that hung about her. "'Find it?' asked Lady Matilda, when her nephew returned to the white drawing-room, as her sitting-room was usually called. "'Interesting face, isn't it?' "'Yes. Quite handsome, too.' It's much better to be interesting than handsome. But you haven't been in Hungary or Austria, have you? You wouldn't meet anyone like her out in Malaya. She wouldn't be sitting around a table there, making little notes or correcting speeches or things like that. She was a wild creature, by all accounts. Lovely manners and all the rest of it, but wild. Wild as a wild bird. She didn't know what danger was. How do you know so much about her? Oh, I agree. I wasn't a contemporary of hers. I wasn't born until several years after she was dead. All the same, I've always been interested in her. She was adventurous, you know, very adventurous. Very queer stories were told about her, about things she was mixed up in. And how did my great-great-great-grandfather react to that? I expect it worried him to death, said Lady Matilda. They say he was devoted to her, though. By the way, Staffy, did you ever read The Prisoner of Zender? Prisoner of Zender? Sounds very familiar. Well, of course it's familiar. It's a book. Yes, yes, I realize it's a book. You wouldn't know about it, I expect, after your time. But when I was a girl, that's about the first taste of romance we got. Not pop singers or Beatles, just a romantic novel. We weren't allowed to read novels when I was young. Not in the morning, anyway. You could read them in the afternoon. Extraordinary rules, said Sir Stafford. Why is it wrong to read novels in the morning and not in the afternoon? When in the mornings, you see, girls were supposed to be doing something useful. You know, doing the flowers, or cleaning the silver photograph frames, all the things we girls did. Doing a bit of studying with the governess, all that sort of thing. In the afternoon we were allowed to sit down and read a storybook, and the prisoner of Zender was usually one of the first ones that came our way. A very nice, respectable story, was it? I seem to remember something about it. Perhaps I did read it. All very pure, I suppose. Not too sexy. Certainly not. We didn't have sexy books, we had romance— the prisoner of Zender was very romantic. One fell in love, usually, with the hero, Rudolf Rassendil. 
I seem to remember that name, too. A bit florid, isn't it? Well, I still think it was rather a romantic name. Twelve years old, I must have been. It made me think of it, you know. You're going up and looking at that portrait. Princess Flavia, she added. Stafford and I were smiling at her. You look young and pink and very sentimental, he said. Well, that's just what I'm feeling. Girls can't feel like that nowadays. They're swooning with love, or they're fainting when somebody plays the guitar or sings in a very loud voice. But they're not sentimental. But I wasn't in love with Rudolf Rassendil. I was in love with the other one, his double. Did he have a double? Oh, yes, the king, the king of Ruritania. Ah, of course, now I know. That's where the word Ruritania comes from. One's always throwing it about. Yes, I think I did read it, you know. The king of Ruritania. And Rudolf Rassendil was stand-in for the king and fell in love with Princess Flavia, to whom the king was officially betrothed. Lady Matilda gave some more deep sighs. Yes, Rudolf Rassendil had inherited his red hair from an ancestress. And somewhere in the book he bows to the portrait and says something about the, uh, I can't remember the name now, the Countess Amelia or something like that, from whom he inherited his looks and all the rest of it. So I looked at you and thought of you as Rudolf Rassendil. And you went out and looked at a picture of someone who might have been an ancestress of yours, and saw whether she reminded you of someone. So you're mixed up in a romance of some kind, aren't you? What on earth makes you say that? Well, there aren't so many patterns in life, you know. One recognizes patterns as they come up. It's like a book on knitting, about sixty-five different fancy stitches. Well, you know a particular stitch when you see it. Your stitch at the moment, I should say, is the romantic adventure. She sighed. But you won't tell me about it, I suppose? There's nothing to tell, said Sir Stafford. You always were quite an accomplished liar. Well, never mind. You bring her to see me sometime, that's all I'd like. Before the doctors succeed in killing me with yet another type of antibiotic that they've just discovered, the different coloured pills I've had to take by this time, you wouldn't believe it. I don't know why you say she and her, don't you? Oh, well, I know a she when I come across a she. There's a she somewhere dodging about in your life. What beats me is how you found her. In Malaya? At the conference table? Ambassador's daughter or minister's daughter? Good-looking secretary from the embassy pool? No, none of it seems to fit. Ship coming home? No, you don't use ships nowadays. Plane, perhaps. You're getting slightly nearer, Sir Stafford and I could not help saying. Ah, she pounced. Air hostess. He shook his head. Ah, well, keep your secret. I shall find out, mind you. I've always had a good nose for things going on where you're concerned. Things generally as well. Of course, I'm out of everything nowadays, but I meet my old cronies from time to time, but it's quite easy, you know, to get a hint or two from them. People are worried. Everywhere they're worried. You mean there's a general kind of discontent? Upset? No, I didn't mean that at all. I mean the high-ups are worried. Our awful governments are worried. The dear old sleepy foreign office is worried. There are things going on. Things that shouldn't be. Unrest. Student unrest? Oh, student unrest is just one flower on the tree. It's blossoming everywhere, in every country or so it seems. I've got a nice girl who comes, you know, and reads the papers to me in the mornings. I can't read them properly myself. She's got a nice voice, takes down my letters, and she reads things from the papers. She's a good, kind girl. She reads the things I want to know, not the things she thinks are right for me to know. Yes, everyone's worried, as far as I can make out, and this, mind you, came more or less from a very old friend of mine. One of your old military cronies. He's a major general, if that's what you mean. Retired a good many years ago, but still in the know. Youth is what you might call the spearhead of it all. But that's not really what's so worrying. They, whoever they are, work through youth. Youth in every country. Youth urged on. Youth chanting slogans. Slogans that sound exciting, though they don't always know what they mean. So easy to start a revolution. That's natural to youth. All youth has always rebelled. You rebel. You pull down. You want the world to be different from what it is, but you're blind, too. There are bandages over the eyes of youth. They can't see where things are taking them. What's going to come next? What's in front of them? And who it is behind them, urging them on? That's what's frightening about it. You know, someone holding out the carrot to get the donkey to come along, and at the same time there is someone behind the donkey, urging it on with a stick. You've got some extraordinary fancies. They're not any fancies, my dear boy. That's what people said about Hitler. Hitler and the Hitler Youth. But it was a long, careful preparation. It was a war that was worked out in detail. It was a fifth column being planted in different countries all ready for the supermen. The supermen were to be the flower of the German nation. That's what they thought, and believed in passionately. Somebody else is perhaps believing something like that now. 
It's a creed that they're willing to accept if it's offered cleverly enough. What are you talking about? Do you mean the Chinese or the Russians? What do you mean? I don't know. I haven't the faintest idea, but there's something, somewhere, and it's running on the same lines. Patton, again, you see, Patton. The Russians, bogged down by communism. I think they're considered old-fashioned. The Chinese, I think they've lost their way. Too much Chairman Mao, perhaps. I don't know who these people are who are doing the planning. As I said before, it's why, and where, and when, and who. Very interesting. It's so frightening, this same idea that always recurs, history repeating itself. The young hero, the golden superman, that all must follow. She paused, then said, Same idea, you know. The young Siegfried. Chapter 7 Advice from Great Aunt Matilda Great Aunt Matilda looked at him. She had a very sharp and shrewd eye. Stafford and I had noticed that before. He noticed it particularly at this moment. So, you've heard that term before, she said. I see. What does it mean? You don't know? She raised her eyebrows. Cross my heart and wish to die, said Sir Stafford, in nursery language. Yes, we always used to say that, didn't we? said Lady Matilda. Do you really mean what you're saying? I don't know anything about it. But you'd heard the term before? Yes. Someone said it to me. Anyone important? It could be. I, I suppose it could be. What do you mean by anyone important? Well, you've been involved in various government missions lately, haven't you? You've represented this poor, miserable country as best you could, which I shouldn't wonder wasn't rather better than many others could do, sitting round a table and talking. I don't know whether anything's come of all that. Probably not, said Stafford and I. After all, one isn't optimistic when one goes into these things. One does one's best, said Lady Matilda correctively. A very Christian principle. Nowadays, if one does one's worst, one often seems to get on a good deal better. What does all this mean, Aunt Matilda? I don't suppose I know, said his aunt. Well, you very often do know things. Not exactly. I just pick up things here and there. Yes? I've got a few old friends left, you know, friends who are in the know. Of course, most of them are either practically stone deaf or half blind or a little bit gone in the top story or unable to walk straight. But something still functions. Something, shall we say, up here. She hit the top of her neatly arranged white head. There's a good deal of alarm and despondency about, more than usual. That's one of the things I've picked up. Isn't there always? Yes, yes, but this is a bit more than that. Active instead of passive, as you might say. For a long time, as I've noticed from the outside, and you no doubt from the inside, we have felt that things are in a mess, a rather bad mess. But now we've got to the point where we feel that perhaps something might have to be done about the mess. There's an element of danger in it. Something is going on. Something is brewing. Not just in one country, in quite a lot of countries. They've recruited a service of their own, and the danger about it is that it's a service of young people, and the kind of people who will go anywhere, do anything, unfortunately believe anything, and so long as they are promised a certain amount of pulling down, wrecking, throwing spanners in the works, then they think the cause must be a good one, and that the world will be a different place. They're not creative, that's the trouble, only destructive. The creative young write poems, write books, probably compose music, paint pictures, just as they've always done. They'll be all right, but once people learn to love destruction for its own sake, evil leadership gets its chance. You say they, or them, who do you mean? Wish I knew, said Lady Matilda. Yes, wish I knew, very much indeed. If I hear anything useful, I'll tell you. Then you can do something about it. Unfortunately, I haven't got anyone to tell, I mean to pass it on to. Yes, don't pass it on to just anyone. You can't trust people. Don't pass it on to any one of those idiots in the government, or connected with the government, or hoping to be participating in the government after this lot runs out. Politicians don't have time to look at the world they're living in. They see the country they're living in, and they see it as one vast electoral platform. That's quite enough to put on their plates for the time being. They do things which they honestly believe will make things better. And then they're surprised when they don't make things better, because they're not the things that people want to have. And one can't help coming to the conclusion that politicians have a feeling that they have a kind of divine right to tell lies in a good cause. It's not really so very long ago since Mr. Baldwin made his famous remark, if I had spoken the truth, I should have lost the election. Prime ministers still feel like that. Now and again, we have a great man, thank God, but it's rare. Well, uh, what do you suggest ought to be done? Are you asking my advice? Mine? Do you know how old I am? Getting on for ninety suggested her nephew. Not quite as old as that, 
said Lady Matilda, slightly affronted. Do I look it, my dear boy? Oh, no, darling, you look a nice, comfortable sixty-six. That's better, said Lady Matilda. Quite untrue, but better. If I get a tip of any kind for one of my dear old admirals, or an old general, or even possibly an air marshal, they do hear things, you know. They've got cronies still, and the old boys get together and talk, and so it gets around. There's always been the grapevine, and there still is a grapevine, no matter how elderly the people are. The young Siegfried. We want a clue to just what that means. I don't know if he's a person, or a password, or the name of a club, or a new messiah, or a pop singer, but that term covers something. There's the musical motif, too. I've rather forgotten my Wagnerian days. Her aged voice croaked out a partially recognisable melody. Siegfried's horn call, isn't that it? Get a recorder, why don't you? Do I mean a recorder? I don't mean a record that you put on a gramophone. I mean the, the things that schoolchildren play. They have the classes for them. I went to a talk the other day. Our vicar got it up. Quite interesting, you know. Tracing the history of the recorder, and the kind of recorders there were from the Elizabethan age onwards. Some big, some small, all different notes and sounds. Very interesting. Very interesting hearing in two senses. The recorders themselves, some of them give out lovely noises, and the history. Yes. Well, what was I saying? Uh, you told me to get one of those instruments, I gather. Yes, get a recorder, and learn to blow Siegfried's horn call on that. Your musical, you always were. You can manage that, I hope. Well, uh, it seems a very small part to play in the salvation of the world, but I dare say I could manage that. And have the thing ready, because, you see— She tapped on the table with her spectacle case. You might want it to impress the wrong people sometime. Might come in useful. They'd welcome you with open arms, and then you might learn a bit. You certainly have ideas, said Sir Stafford, admiringly. What else can you have when you're my age? said his great-aunt. You can't get about. You can't meddle with people much. You can't do any gardening. All you can do is sit in your chair and have ideas. Remember that when you're forty years older? One remark you made interested me. Only one, said Lady Matilda. That's rather a poor measure, considering how much I've been talking. What was it? You suggested that I might be capable of impressing the wrong people with my recorder. Did you mean that? Well, it's one way, isn't it? The right people don't matter, but the wrong people? Well, you've got to find out things, haven't you? You've got to permeate things, rather like a Death Watch beetle, she said thoughtfully. So I should make significant noises in the night? Well, that sort of thing, yes. We had a Death Watch beetle in the East Wing here once. Very expensive it was, to put it right. I dare say it will be just as expensive to put the world right. In fact, a good deal more expensive, said Stafford Nye. Well, that won't matter, said Lady Matilda. People never mind spending a great deal of money. It impresses them. It's when you want to do things economically they won't play. We're the same people, you know, in this country. I mean, we're the same people we always were. What do you mean by that? We're capable of doing big things. We were good at running an empire. We weren't good at keeping an empire running, but then, you see, we didn't need an empire any more, and we've recognized that. Too difficult to keep up. Robbie made me see that, she added. Robbie? It was faintly familiar. Robbie Shoreham. Robert Shoreham. He's a very old friend of mine, paralyzed down the left side, but he can still talk, and he's got a moderately good hearing aid. Besides being one of the most famous physicists in the world, said Stafford Nye. So he's another of your old cronies, is he? Known him since he was a boy, said Lady Matilda. I suppose it surprises you that we should be friends, have a lot in common, and enjoy talking together? Well, I shouldn't have thought that, that we had much to talk about. It's true, I could never do mathematics. Fortunately, when I was a girl, one didn't even try. Mathematics came easily to Robbie when he was about four years old, I believe. They say nowadays that that's quite natural. He's got plenty to talk about. He liked me always because I was frivolous and made him laugh. I'm a good listener, too, and really, he says some very interesting things sometimes. So I suppose, said Stafford Nye dryly. Now, don't be superior. Mollier married his housemaid, didn't he? Made a great success of it. If it is Mollier, I mean. If a man's frantic with brains, he doesn't really want a woman who's also frantic with brains to talk to. It would be exhausting. He'd much prefer a lovely nitwit who could make him laugh. I wasn't bad looking when I was young, said Lady Matilda complacently. I know I have no academic distinctions. I'm not in the least intellectual, but Robert has always said that I've got a great deal of common sense, of intelligence. You're a lovely person, said Sir Stafford Nye. I enjoy coming to see you, and I shall go away remembering all the things you've said to me. There are a good many more things, I expect, that you could tell me, but you're obviously not going to. Not until the right moment comes, said Lady Matilda. But I've got your interests at heart. Let me know what you're doing from time to time. You're dining at the American Embassy, aren't you, next week? How did you know that? 
I've been asked. And you've accepted, I understand. Well, it's uh, all in the course of duty. He looked at her curiously. How do you manage to be so well informed? Oh, Millie told me. Millie? Millie Jean Courtman, the American ambassador's wife, a most attractive creature, you know, small and rather perfect-looking. Oh, you mean Mildred Courtman? She was christened Mildred, but she preferred Millie Jean. I was talking to her on the telephone about some charity matinee or other. She's what we used to call a pocket Venus. A most attractive term to use, said Stafford Nye. Chapter 8 An Embassy Dinner As Mrs. Courtman came to meet him with outstretched hand, Stafford Nye recalled the term his great-aunt had used. Millie Jean Courtman was a woman of between thirty-five and forty. She had delicate features, big blue-gray eyes, a very perfectly shaped head with bluish-gray hair tinted to a particularly attractive shade which fitted her with a perfection of grooming. She was very popular in London. Her husband, Sam Courtman, was a big, heavy man, slightly ponderous. He was very proud of his wife. He himself was one of those slow, rather over-emphatic talkers. People found their attention occasionally straying when he was elucidating at some length a point which hardly needed making. Back from Malaya, aren't you, Sir Stafford? It must have been quite interesting to go out there, though it's not the time of year I'd have chosen. But I'm sure we're all glad to see you back. Now let me see now. You know Lady Alborough, and Sir John, and Herr von Roken, Frau von Roken, Mr. and Mrs. Stagenham. They were all people known to Stafford Nye in more or less degree. There was a Dutchman and his wife, whom he had not met before, since they had only just taken up their appointment. The Stagenhams were the Minister of Social Security and his wife, a particularly uninteresting couple, he had always thought. And the Countess Renata Zirkowski. I think she said she'd met you before. It must be about a year ago, when I was last in England, said the Countess. And there she was, the passenger from Frankfurt again. Self-possessed, at ease, beautifully turned out in faint grey-blue with a touch of chinchilla, her hair dressed high, a wig, and a ruby cross of antique design round her neck. Signor Gasparo, Count Reitner, Mr. and Mrs. Arbuthnot, about twenty-six in all. At dinner, Stafford Nye sat between the dreary Mrs. Stagenham and Signora Gasparo. Renata Sikowski sat exactly opposite him. An embassy dinner, a dinner such as he so often attended, holding much of the same type of guests, various members of the diplomatic corps, junior ministers, one or two industrialists, a sprinkling of socialites usually included because they were good conversationalists, natural, pleasant people to meet, though one or two, thought Stafford Nye, one or two were maybe different. Even while he was busy sustaining his conversation with Signora Gasparo, a charming person to talk to, a chatterbox, slightly flirtatious, his mind was roving in the same way that his eye also roved, though the latter was not very noticeable. As it roved round the dinner table, you would not have said that he was summing up conclusions in his own mind. He had been asked here. Why? For any reason, or for no reason in particular? Because his name had come up automatically on the list that the secretaries produced from time to time with checks against such members as were due for their turn or as the extra man or the extra woman required for the balancing of the table. He had always been in request when an extra was needed. Oh, yes, a diplomatic hostess would say. Stafford and I will do beautifully. You will put him next to Madame So-and-so, or Lady Somebody Else. He had been asked, perhaps, to fill in for no further reason than that. And yet he wondered. He knew by experience that there were certain other reasons. And so his eye, with its swift social amiability, its air of not looking really at anything in particular, was busy. Amongst these guests, there was someone, perhaps, who for some reason mattered, was important. Someone who had been asked not to fill in. On the contrary, someone who had had a selection of other guests invited to fit in round him, or her. Someone who mattered. He wondered. He wondered which of them it might be. Courtman knew, of course. Millie Jean, perhaps. One never really knew with wives. Some of them were better diplomats than their husbands. Some of them could be relied upon merely for their charm, for their adaptability, their readiness to please, their lack of curiosity. 
Some, again, he thought ruefully to himself, were, as far as their husbands were concerned, disasters. Hostesses who, though they may have brought prestige or money to a diplomatic marriage, were yet capable at any moment of saying or doing the wrong thing, and creating an unfortunate situation. If that was to be guarded against, it would need one of the guests, or two, or even three of the guests, to be what one might call professional smoothers over. Did this dinner party this evening mean anything but a social event? His quick and noticing eye had by now been round the dinner table picking out one or two people whom so far he had not entirely taken in. An American businessman. Pleasant. Not socially brilliant. A professor from one of the universities of the Middle West. A married couple, the husband German, the wife predominantly, almost aggressively, American. A very beautiful woman, too. Sexually highly attractive, Sir Stafford thought. Was one of them important? Initials floated through his mind. FBI. CIA. The businessman, perhaps a CIA man, there for a purpose. Things were like that nowadays, not as they used to be. How had the formula gone? Big Brother is watching you. Yes, well, it went further than that now. Transatlantic Cousin is watching you. High Finance for Middle Europe is watching you. A diplomatic difficulty has been asked here for you to watch him. Oh, yes. There was often a lot behind things nowadays. But was that just another formula? Just another fashion? Could it really mean more than that? Something vital? Something real? How did one talk of events in Europe nowadays? The common market. Well, that was fair enough. That dealt with trade, with economics, with the interrelationships of countries. That was the stage to set. But behind the stage, backstage, waiting for the cue, ready to prompt if prompting were needed, what was going on, going on in the big world? Yes, she was at home here. He could find out, he thought, without much difficulty where she figured in the diplomatic world, but would that tell him where she really had her place? The young woman in the slacks, who had spoken to him suddenly at Frankfurt, had had an eager, intelligent face. Was that the real woman? Or was this casual social acquaintance the real woman? Was one of those personalities a part being played? And if so, which one? And there might be more than just those two personalities. He wondered. He wanted to find out. Or had the fact that he had been asked to meet her been pure coincidence? Millie Jean was rising to her feet. The other ladies rose with her. Then suddenly an unexpected clamour arose. A clamour from outside the house. Shouts, yells, the crash of breaking glass in a window. Shouts, sounds, surely pistol shots. Signora Gasparo spoke, clutching Stafford Nye's arm. What again? she exclaimed. Dio! Again it is those terrible students. It is the same in our country. Why do they attack embassies? They fight, resist the police, go marching, shouting idiotic things, lie down in the streets. See, see, we have them in Rome, in Milan, we have them like a pest everywhere in Europe. Why are they never happy, these young ones? What do they want? Stafford Nye sipped his brandy and listened to the heavy accents of Mr. Charles Stagenham, who was being pontifical and taking his time about it. The commotion had subsided. It would seem that the police had marched off some of the hotheads. It was one of those occurrences which once would have been thought extraordinary and even alarming, but which were now taken as a matter of course. A larger police force, that's what we need, a larger police force. It's more than these chaps can deal with. It's the same everywhere, they say. I was talking to Herr Lowitz the other day. They have their troubles, so have the French. Not quite so much of it in the Scandinavian countries. What do they all want? Just trouble. I tell you, if I had my way... Stafford Nye removed his mind to another subject while keeping up a flattering pretense as Charles Stagenham explained just what his way would be, which in any case was easily to be anticipated beforehand. Shouting about Vietnam and all that. What do any of them know about Vietnam? None of them have ever been there, have they? One would think it very unlikely, said Sir Stafford Nye. Man was telling me earlier this evening, I've had a lot of trouble in California, in the universities, if we had a sensible policy. Presently the men joined the ladies in the drawing-room, Stafford Nye moving with that leisurely grace, that air of complete lack of purpose he found so useful, sat down by a golden-haired, talkative woman whom he knew moderately well, and who could be guaranteed seldom to say anything worth listening to as regards ideas or wit, but who was excessively knowledgeable about all her fellow-creatures within the bounds of her acquaintance.
Stafford and I asked no direct questions, but presently, without the lady being even aware of the means by which he had guided the subject of conversation, he was hearing a few remarks about the Countess Renata Zakowski. Still very good-looking, isn't she? She doesn't come over here very often nowadays, mostly in New York, you know, or that wonderful island place. You know the one I mean? Not Binorca, um, one of the other ones in the Mediterranean. Her sister's manager, that Soap King. At least, I think it's a Soap King. Oh, not the Greek one. He's Swedish, I think, rolling in money. And then, of course, she spends a lot of time in some castle place in the Dolomites, or near Munich. Very musical, she always has been. She said you'd met before, didn't she? Yes, uh, a year or two years ago, I think. Ah, uh, yes. I suppose when she was over in England before. They say she was mixed up in the Czechoslovakian business. Or do I mean the Polish trouble? Oh, dear, it's so difficult, isn't it? All these names, I mean. Huh. They have so many Zs and Ks. Most peculiar, and so hard to spell. She's very literary, you know. Gets up petitions for people to sign, to give writers asylum here, or whatever it is. Not that anyone really pays much attention. I mean, what else can one think of nowadays, except how one can possibly pay one's own taxes? The travel allowance makes things a little better, but not much. I mean, you've got to get the money, haven't you, before you can take it abroad. I don't know how anyone manages to have money now. But there's a lot of it about. Oh, yes, there's a lot of it about. She looked down, in a complacent fashion, at her left hand, on which were two solitaire rings, one a diamond and one an emerald, which seemed to prove conclusively that a considerable amount of money had been spent upon her, at least. The evening drew to its close. He knew very little more about his passenger from Frankfurt than he had known before. He knew that she had a façade. A façade, it seemed to him, very highly faceted, if you could use those two alliterative words together. She was interested in music. Well, he had met her at the festival hall, had he not? Fond of outdoor sports. Rich relations who owned Mediterranean islands. Given to supporting literary charities. Somebody, in fact, who had good connections, was well related, had entries to the social field. Not apparently highly political, and yet, quietly perhaps, affiliated to some group. Someone who moved about from place to place and country to country. Moving among the rich, amongst the talented about the literary world. He thought of espionage for a moment or two. That seemed the most likely answer. And yet he was not wholly satisfied with it. The evening drew on. It came at last to be his turn to be collected by his hostess. Millie Jean was very good at her job. I've been longing to talk to you for ages. I wanted to hear about Malaya. I'm so stupid about all those places in Asia, you know. I mix them up. Tell me, what happened out there? Anything interesting, or was everything terribly boring? I'm sure you can guess the answer to that one. Well, I should guess it was very boring, but perhaps you're not allowed to say so. Oh, yes, I can think it, and I can say it. It wasn't really my cup of tea, you know. Why did you go, then? Oh, well, I'm always fond of travelling. I like seeing countries. You're such an intriguing person in many ways. Really, of course, all. Diplomatic life is very boring, isn't it? I oughtn't to say so. I only say it to you. Very blue eyes. Blue like bluebells in a wood. They opened a little wider, and the black brows above them came down gently at the outside corners, while the inside corners went up a little. It made her face look like a rather beautiful Persian cat. He wondered what Millie Jean was really like. Her soft voice was that of a southerner. The beautifully shaped little head, her profile with the perfection of a coin. What was she really like? No fool, he thought. One who could use social weapons when needed, who could charm when she wished to, who could withdraw into being enigmatic. If she wanted anything from anyone, she would be adroit at getting it. He noticed the intensity of the glance she was giving him now. Did she want something of him? He didn't know. He didn't think it could be likely. She said... Have you met Mr. Stagenham? Ah, y yes, I was talking to him at the dinner table. I hadn't met him before. He is said to be very important, said Millie Jean. He's the president of PBF, as you know. One should know all these things, said Sir Stafford Nye. PBF and DCV, LYH, and all the world of initials. Hateful, said Millie Jean. Hateful. All those initials. No personalities. No people any more, just initials. What a hateful world. That's what I sometimes think. What a hateful world. I want it to be different. Quite, quite different. 
Did she mean that? He thought for one moment that perhaps she did. Interesting. End of Disc 2